Helen, why don't you, um, you want to start off and just sort of say hello to everybody and then throw to me with the second slide? Uh, okay, John, do you want to start? Um, I go? Yeah, no, I think uh, Helen's going to start and then she's going okay. to with me. Great. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today um, to John and I's discussion about um, reproducibility. We've given the talk the title of Repeatability, Replication and Reproducibility because the first two things lead into the latter. Um, we were going to kind of ping pong things backwards and forwards today and just really uh, raise a set of discussion points and things to, to think about. So John will lead off by talking about the background to the problem and um, the scope and scale of it, really. Um, I'll talk about our experience at the Ramashori Centre and what we sort of see uh, across the community. Then we'll hop back to John again and he can uh, walk us through really the importance of spending time doing experimental design um, and his own personal experience and um, discussing unknown and ignored variables. Pop back to me to go through the execution of the experiment, so that real technical component of actually executing your design, and then back to John again to talk about unconscious bias. So that's kind of where we're, we're heading. So I'll hand over to John now, and he can um, walk you through the background to the, the problem. Yeah, thank you, Helen, and, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's been a problem that's been on our mind for some time. Um, uh, and it's something that um, I don't think enough people are taking uh, notice of. Um, the, the extent of the problem and the causes of the problem, and the causes are many and varied, but they do conspire to have a, a serious um, uh, loss of reproducibility in what we publish. And I think um, Helen and I will be at pains to say that what we're talking about today is not about BABS per se, but about the general experience across the landscape, across the country, across the world in molecular and cell biology. Interestingly, if you do a bit of background reading on the irreproducibility of science, the two disciplines that stand out um, in this regard, unfortunately, are biomedical science and psychology. And uh, there's a lot of unconscious bias and uh, other things in psychology and, and difficult stats, but we're going to concentrate today on molecular and cellular biological research, the sort of things that we do in BABS. Um, and so I just listed here, uh, Helen, um, just a few findings that, sorry, a few papers that have reported this irreproducibility. And it's only, there's only three here of many, and anybody who wants to Google irreproducibility of you know science can can uh, find a lot of literature online it actually started back in nature in 2012 and uh, by paper first authored by glenn begley who used to be at the walton eliza hall institute in melbourne but was then or still is maybe at um no i think it's back now but um at, at amgen and uh, amgen researchers uh, uh, glenn begley and his colleague ellis uh, reported that they were unable to reproduce the findings of 47 out of 53 landmark cancer papers, many of which were published in, in the tier one journals like Nature and Science. A later report in 2015 showed that the reported that the cumulative prevalence of irreproducible preclinical research exceeds 50%. And they estimated that this was a loss of $28 billion a year um, uh, in the United States alone of money that was wasted on, on irreproducible research. And then um, uh, in 2017, these are just the three I picked, uh, empirical efforts of reproducibility checks on a number of top-sided publications um, from leading academic institutions have shown reproducibility rates of only 11% to 25%. Now, you put these numbers together, you're saying at least half and possibly three quarters or more of all publications um, are not reproducible. And this is shocking. I mean, it's shocking from many, many points of view, not the least of waste of money and time for students, postdocs, uh, and others who might be relying on these or believing the, the data. So, uh, and I might say that uh, I didn't put this here, but in my reading, apparently the uh, frequency of irreproducibility irre has nothing to do with the impact factor of the journals that are, uh, the material is published in, uh, which is interesting in itself. 
So um, that's the general experience globally and well validated and a, a really major concern. Uh, and I think from, for an enterprise like ours and for our students and postdocs, this is really something we have to think about and try to address. So Helen's gonna talk now about her particular experience on the ground in, in RAMAC uh, that just reinforces these general findings that I've talked about. So um, when I volunteered um, myself to talk about this topic and share our experiences at the Ramachari Centre, I did it for sort of two reasons. The first is that Ramachari, we really get a, a good look um, into the laboratory practices um, around the country and get a feel for the kind of state of the nation really, and that is the overall standard of the general um, lab knowledge and basic skills of those who are actually tasked with performing these experiments. And the second is that Ramachari is now an ATA accredited facility. So we really understand what is required to ensure replication and repeatability for a test. And going through NATA was a real kind of eye opener for us um, uh, to see the gulf between what the research lab standards were and what those were expected um, of an accredited laboratory. So we work with about 500 individual researchers per year who submit about a thousand projects and Underneath those projects is about 80,000 samples, and we've analysed over a million samples in total. So we, we see a lot. And I'm really quite sad, actually, to report that the general feedback is that from our contact with the community, there's really a considerable gap in knowledge, and there's a lot of very poor technical skills, when there really probably shouldn't be. And we feel that a lot of um, researchers struggle with the basics and are a little lost at times. And... Sometimes they're thrown in at the deep end and there's a bit of a sink or swim attitude. Um, you know, you'll, oh, you'll sort it out. And, and this kind of leads to um, a lot of sweeping under the carpet of known issues. And I've discussed this offline with John. And this is often because people are feeling a lot of pressure to produce data and it leads to corners being cut and poor outcomes. So to share one recent example with you, and we have many, many we can share, is... Um, a researcher submitted uh, 24 plates of um, DNA samples to us, uh, about 2,300 samples in total. And when they arrived to us, the plate seals um, seemed to have, there was uh, liquid between the wells under the plate seal. So we contacted him and said, oh, okay, um, what would you like to do? He said, oh, it's, all, it's okay. I just left the plate sitting in the ice bucket and the water just got in around the wells because the, the ice thawed. Well, we have to analyze those samples and produce a certain amount of data at the end. So we're deeply suspicious that this was actually the case. So we tested what was in between the wells and it was DNA. So we wrote back to the researcher and said, oh, okay, well, actually we're not convinced that it was just the ice leaking in. It probably is DNA that's between the wells. And the response was, please go ahead with the project. This was $80,000 worth. Of research that was being conducted in admixed samples across all of those plates. So that's just one example of what happens out in the field essentially. So I really wanted to kind of ask um, us as a community what can we do to sort of prevent people doing these types of things because the reason why they do them and I've probably got some ideas that I can share with you um, about some of the things that we can do but it is a kind of it's a problem um, that's kind of bigger than just technical stuff too. So I'll hand back to John now to discuss experimental designs and variables, and then you can pop back to me and I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the things that we think might be going on. Yeah, um, uh, thanks. I think before I get into this, Helen, I'll just talk about my personal experience um, because I didn't put a slide in for that. But uh, so maybe if you go back to yours, because it's prettier than this one. <laughs> <laughs> I should have found a cartoon or something. Um, I, I just wanted to share with everybody uh, a, a, an epiphany that I had when I first started doing a postdoc. Uh, I went to the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, one in the center of the biggest medical center in the world. And I'm working for a very driven boss. And of course, everybody in the States is very driven. And I had the experience uh, of... Uh, that my boss, who was a lovely guy, uh, would come around every morning and evening, and if he saw me sitting down, he would bang the table like that, and he'd say, come on, John, we've got to get on with it. And so I'd sort of think, oh, well, I've got to be doing more experiments. And, and he had me running around 
um, you know, like, like a blue ass fly. And I, I get halfway through an experiment. I was rushing everything um, because I felt under pressure to produce data um, and to be active. And uh, I find myself halfway through an experiment thinking, oh, bugger, I forgot to add that or that control wasn't there or whatever it was. So I was making um, regular mistakes, both in the design, but also the execution of the experiment. So after a couple of months of this, I said to my boss, whose name was Sally, I said, Sally, I said, give me a break. Let me work at my own pace. And I, I, I overreacted. I think Marcel's probably heard this story uh, in the past. Um, and, and I overreacted and sort of really slowed down. And because I'd made so many mistakes in design and execution under pressure, I, I decided to really plan things carefully. So I planned the experiment really carefully, designed, made sure the controls were there, etc. I wrote down what was in every tube to the microliter, thought about it carefully, and then pinned up that um, stuff in front of my face and then executed my own uh, um, instructions very carefully. So I only did about one experiment a week, but that experiment was always worked brilliantly. I usually got the result I expected, very clean data, et cetera. And when I didn't get the result I expected, I was pretty confident that I'd ex executed properly, even though I needed, you know, obviously to repeat it. What I was going from was one badly run uh, and executed designed experiment, uh, you know, uh, two or three a week to one really good one. And my productivity just soared and went through the roof. And I'm a great, uh, I firmly believe now that the more time that one spends in planning and designing an experiment before you get to execution, the better. In fact, you need to spend more time in the design than you do in the execution. And then if it's designed very carefully, you don't have to be thinking about the design while you're executing and you actually focus on repeating carefully and getting all of that uh, correct. So um, that's my first philosophical advice. I'll come back at the end about unconscious bias to talk philosophically again, but really, really, it was so important to me and it made such a difference to my productivity to think carefully about lab design and execution. Recommend it to everybody. So let's look at some of the reasons why um, things might not be reproducible. And, and one of the huge ones is uh, unknown and ignored variables. And um, the first I want to just briefly discuss is the, you know, the, the problem of complex and largely undefined media components such as fetal calf serum. And I had an experience a, a few years ago when I was setting up the garden when a senior colleague came in and asked me if we could spend several million dollars buying five years worth of fetal calf serum. And I said, well, why do you want to do that? And um, I kind of knew the answer, but nevertheless, I asked the question and uh, he said, uh, well, because if we don't use the same batch of fetal calf serum, we might get different results, or we do get different results. And I looked at him and said, well, that means your experiments are totally useless because the people who read your papers are not going to have the same batch of fetal calf serum. So there is a variable in that component of the media which is affecting the outcome of the experiment. So it means that it's basically a total waste of time. He looked a bit shocked, but it actually shocked me that people would <laughs> try to to ensure the reproducibility of the results by using one batch of a reagent which was not reproducible elsewhere. So that's a huge problem. And if anybody is doing experiments where they have to rely on batch effects of getting the same batch of things like fetal calf serum, then you, know, you might as well just go to the beach because it's a waste of your time and everybody else's time and money. So the other, th the other things that we might just briefly uh, canvas are, um, the idiosyncratic variation in temperature, humidity, transit times from incubators. And I learned this because I got involved with a, a company uh, in England that does robotic experiments. And uh, they pointed out that, for example, you know, if you take a cells out of cultured cells out of an incubator, sometimes it might be one minute before they go into an assay, sometimes it might be 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And that has a these temperature changes have tremendous effects on the, or can have on the behavior of the cells. So there are a whole range of, um, you know, unknown variants, variations in these environmental factors. And, uh, you know, a good protocol would be sort of defining very carefully about these things, even though they seem trivial, so that anybody else who wants to repeat the experiment uh, is going to be able to do it. And you want to minimize these vari variations as well, of course. So next one is um, uncharacterized cell lines or strains. 
I didn't have time to look it up, but I understand that the actual number, but I understand that uh, a significant proportion of all cell lines floating around the world are actually HeLa cells because HeLa is so aggressive and it can contaminate just like fungus or, or bacteria in, 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 in culture hoods. So uh, one of the uh, recommendations in literature is that cell lines should be uh, char you know, characterized genotypically uh, regularly by um, you know, DNA fingerprinting or, or now it'd be just as easy just to throw them into the sequencer. But a lot of times the, the cell lines that are being used are not the cell lines that people think they're using or they've drifted around under you know, selection conditions in labs because of cell culturing. It's particularly true with bacterial strains and I had the experience some years ago when we made a bacterial mutant uh, and we thought we were studying a strain that was isogenic with the parent strain, except for the gene that we'd knocked out. But it turned out when we dug in, and it was an accidental finding that the um, deletion of the particular gene that we were interested in had then placed selection pressure on the rest of the genome so that in subculturing, uh, it had been selected for compensatory mutations elsewhere in the genome. And we weren't quite studying what we thought we were studying. So, um, you know, cell lines and, and bacterial strains need to be regularly um, sequenced to make sure that uh, you know what you're dealing with. Next one, Helen, is, um, uh, and I picked this up from reading, but um, it's obvious when you, you, you're told about it, there's enormous edge effects and non-uniform cell growth in microtidoplates, which can affect the assays and also any particularly imaging assays that are, you know, for, for high throughput um, siRNA screens or whatever they might, might be. Next one is um, um, co dealing with complex tissues, uh, what I call the smoothie problem. Uh, a lot of people do RNA-seq, for example, um, on, um, on, on tissues, uh, whether it's the brain or kidney or muscle or whatever, and look for whether it's done with microarrays or, or with, DNA, with RNA sequencing per se, more recently, people assume that when they see some, some uh, parameter uh, gene go up in the changing parameter, or two genes go up or one go up and one go down, these things are correlated when in fact they might be and often are occurring in totally different subsets of cells within a complex tissue. And so almost all of the uh, gene regulatory network uh, reports that have been done uh, on, on tissues um, are just a waste of time because you don't know whether the, uh, the events that you're seeing in between state A and state B uh, for gene, gene X and Y are actually correlated or just occurring in different cells. Uh, so that's a huge problem of, of um, perceptual um, unknowns. Next one is, and I think the last one is, well, no, second last one is, um, and this came up in my reading too, that people use different imaging or, or data processing analysis programs and they can quite uh, profoundly affect the reporting of the, the data that you're seeing. And so it's, that's really important to, to be aware of the idiosyncrasies of these programs. Not much you can do about it except to report which program you're using, but one should be aware that the program may itself be biasing the outcome of your analysis or at least influencing it. And the last thing, just in a more general sense, is a lot of use of poor statistics, you know, p values of less than 0.05, you might as well go out and go to the beach on that one. I mean, people think that's important, but you know, triple biological or technical replicates. People, I think uh, Helen's going to talk about this briefly, doesn't, don't understand the difference between technical and biological replicates. Um, so, you know, and, and it's very easy to do cherry picking when you're doing large scale experiments. And, and that cherry picking is highly biased by the unconscious bias I'll talk about at the end. And a lot of people don't, uh, you know, uh, understand that when they look at a gene list of things that might be increased in expression, for example, that they, they naturally hone into the ones that they think might be interesting and then do much further work on that. So that's really, uh, uh, you know, selection bias as well. And there are others uh, that no doubt we sh that occur and that we should be thinking about to try to make sure that when we do an experiment, particularly in cell culture, that um, we, we're standardising the conditions as much as we can. Perhaps my final comment here is that particularly with mammalian cells in culture or animal cells in culture, you know, most of the, the genome is there to, to program development, not physiology or biochemistry. And the poor old cells don't know that they're, they're in a dish, they're trying to make a human or a mouse or whatever it is. And so 
they're behaving in all sorts of ways which are totally artificial and uh, can be very much affected by uh, the, uh, the, vari the variables that I've mentioned above uh, because they're just totally confused. So um, one has to be very, very um, cautious about interpreting any experiment for cell culture and cell culture, I think. I don't want to depress you too much, but uh, there's, there's a whole range of uh, pitfalls here, um, for both known and then unknown and often ignored variables like fetal calf serum. So back to Helen. Okay, so um, I just wanted to sort of go through, the, you've, you've, you've organized what you're gonna do, you've, you've thought through your experiment, you've planned it, you've, you've raised the cash um, to do so. Uh, what, what now? Um, so I tend to kind of break the experiment into kind of four chunks. There's the methods uh, and protocols that you will follow. There's the equipment and reagents that you will use. Uh, and there's documentation, how you're going to record what you've done. And then the training. So what, how are you trained to perform the task? And I think all of these contribute to whether you can actually execute that experiment well and reliably replicate or reproduce it. Um, I think really ensuring that things are re uh, able to be replicated is seen as very, very dull work. Um, it's unpublishable. Therefore, it's not rewarded, and hence, I think it's probably just not valued. And I think this is one of the root causes of uh, the reproducibility issue and something that will have to be fixed if we're to resolve the problem. And we need to find a kind of way to reward or acknowledge the importance of getting this stuff right. Otherwise, the problem will just persist. Um, so in each of my slides, I'll kind of pose a question uh, or questions for discussion and where I think the community might need to think about how we approach things at the moment and then what we can do uh, to change the issue. And on each slide, I'll also give one very small tip for success. And these trips, uh, tips may seem trivial, silly or obvious, uh, but I can assure you they're really not obvious to everyone. We just aren't. <laughs> um, okay. So methods and protocols. So I think of a method as um, the thing that's, um, you know, uh, summarized in a paper and published. It's a very high level overview of um, what you did. A protocol would be a precise step-by-step uh, -step set of instructions or recipes, and for the most part um, remains unpublished. Um, so I would sort of pose the question that um, um, should we be thinking about publishing these? I've seen a lot of protocols which are essentially a post-it note on the wall of the lab. This is a qubit protocol post-it note, which you could actually um, do a qubit assay following this post-it note. You, you'd manage to do it. You'd get a reading at the end, but that reading is probably going to be inaccurate. Our qubit protocol at RAMAC now that we've gone through accreditation is 18 pages long to ensure that it's robust and it's got internal controls bit built in there to make sure that each time it is um, uh, done, you get the same reproducible result. So I think you know a lot of labs run on post-it protocols, dog-eared um, protocols shoved under the bench. And I think that's probably something that we really have to try and change and try and standardize our, um, our protocols across the way. So really without precise instructions, how can anyone be expected to be repeat or replicate an experiment? And should publishing protocols used in a paper be mandatory? I know that there's protocol.io um, and um, nature protocols, but really the vast majority of stuff is, is unpublished and hidden away in a cupboard somewhere. So I've had one tip to share with you about methods and protocols is if you do use standard and routine protocols in your lab, try to make sure that they are written up and that you capture all those little handwritten scribbles in the corner that people will do when they make protocol improvements. Change the protocol, reissue the protocol so that everyone's sort of singing from the same song sheet. And if possible, always include internal controls in those protocols so you can tell when it's going wrong and it's not going according to plan. So. That's sort of my feeling in methods and protocols. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there um, across a lot of labs. And we have to say, you know, we learn every day about how to change things. We struggle a lot with writing protocols. They're hard things to write, but it's definitely 
worth the time and energy doing so. Equipment and materials um, are a big player in when things can be repeated or not. Um, equipment in Babs, you've got a great tech team. They look after your equipment. They make sure it's, it's working for you and well maintained. You have your pets calibrated every year. But in between those yearly calibrations, does anyone check? Does anyone make sure that um, the pipettes are still preparing what they're meant to do? Do you do monthly, weekly, um, six monthly checks? Do you check your balance in between calibration? Do you check your oven temperature or do you just believe the little 37 on the door? Um, these are things that you should probably just build into your kind of standard laboratory practice to make sure that um, it is doing what it says it's doing. Um, Pipetting, it has to be one of the worst for us at the centre. We get lots of submissions that say they've submitted plates with a uniform 50 microliters in the plate and the volume is super varied. So clearly there are problems with pipetting. I mean, I've, I've seen it in laboratories when you look through the window, people pipet like this. They don't even look, they don't even check that the pipette is actually picking up what it's meant to and they're fully dispensed. So these are these are easily fixed, really easily fixed issues. The other thing is um, reagents. Um, how are your reagents made? How are they used and how are they managed in your lab? How do you know that two-year-old buffer that's sitting on the bench that great actually still works? I think there's a huge amount of um, sort of faith in the reagents that people make and, and use. And I think um, it's misplaced really, I think. People should be very, very careful about what they're um, using in their experiments because it does cause all sorts of um, issues along the way. Um, in terms of my tip for equipment and materials, this is the simplest tip ever. It's invest in a decent set of marker pens, black marker pens, and buy a label printer if you can. The number of um, problems we have with just not being able to read what's in the container that we get is it's a lot, it's, it's a significant percentage. So I think even just being sure that you're going into the freezer to get the, the thing that you, you want and you can read that label, I think it's such a simple trick, but it's just a cause of so many headaches, I think in the laboratory. As I say, I know you're probably thinking, oh yeah, yeah, but this is such a huge problem. Uh, the other thing is um, documentation. I think we thought we were quite good at documentation before we got NATA accreditation. And I can tell you, I don't think we were that good. And um, the, it, the level required um, for NATA is, is high. But I think there are some simple things that research laboratories can do to really improve in this area. Things around sample inventory and tracking, coming up with your own laboratory's um, naming system so you know what's what. We've been asked when we've run an experiment, can you tell me which ones are my controls and which ones are my treatments? Because I actually don't know. So having that real consistent um, system about sample labeling, it would be just you know, a fantastic thing. Um, and recording all the metadata around that sample, recording the protocol that you use in the experiment, what version of the protocol you use, and any variables to that experimental condition. Also recording who did what and when is, is important, I think, um, to know um, and review, actually reviewing that lab work and checking off and making sure there's a kind of cross check and what's done. So that's the, um, that's, a, that's a big piece documentation. It's really time consuming, but I think ultimately very, very worthwhile doing. So the question I wanted to ask is, I wonder how many of us would be 100% confident that someone else could read your lab notes and replicate what you did um, one month, two months, a year down the track. I think many of us um, have gone into a new laboratory to follow on from the last postdoc's work. And so I've been handed the lab book and said, off you go, and just not been able to do it. You've had to do the work again and start from scratch. So. How wonderful would it be to be given a set of notes and documentation where you didn't have to go back, but you could actually start and progress and not waste all that time again. So I think documentation is very important and should be something that the laboratories focus on. One tip about documentation is provide some structure for what you want. There's nothing more confronting than a blank page and being told to document what you do. And I think we have the most fantastic resource at, um, at the university, we've got lab archives. I don't know how many of you use it, but we absolutely love it. We couldn't 
we couldn't live without it now. We use it for so many things. We tag people on it. We use it um, to record all sorts of information. And we spend a lot of time developing um, things like um, project templates, um, where we actually kind of lay out the, what an experiment should look like. And in our case, you can see this is sample receipt, we've got financial information and so on, but you can see sample QC, library prep and QC. So there's a page for every kind of thing you want to do. You can build little widgets like this one. Um, this is a sample uh, receipt record, but this could be for any experiment that you do routinely. If it's qPCR, how many cycles did you use? What were the primers you used? What was the, the kit and, and so on? You have mm. calculators inbuilt into um, widgets as well. So if it's a common calculation, we just build a widget for that and make sure that everyone is actually using that same calculation um, for that uh, experiment. And lastly, database widgets where we have Excel spreadsheets where this is us lot tracking in this particular one where we lot track all the different um, components of a kit. So it's hugely powerful and they've actually got a series of, um, I think, um, seminars or workshops coming up to teach people how to use lab archives. Hugely powerful and just a fantastic thing to have at your fingertips and really can't um, sing its praises enough. The last thing I wanted to talk about um, before handing back to John today is training. And this is a, this is a big thing. Um, if you think about your laboratory, how, how is training conducted? Um, how do you record it? Who conducts the training? Are they confident to train someone else? Do they have the skills to train someone else? And do they have the time to invest in training someone else? Are they kind of doing it on the side when they've got a mountain of work themselves? And then once you've actually trained someone to do a task, how do you know they're actually competent at doing that task? You, do you have a kind of set of tick boxes you can make sure that they actually know what they're doing? So we've spent quite a bit of time um, building training records um, at the centre. And again, I'm not suggesting that research labs do this, but it's just to think about some of the simple things you could do to just make life a little bit easier um, for lab staff. This is a training record for using the uh, Viaflow. The Viaflow is just a big 96 head pipette. So it's just kind of plate stamps and things. And this is Christy's training record. And you can see that she has read the documentation a number of times. She's watched the task. She's performed the task under supervision. And then she's achieved an independent result. And she's got a kind of score as to our competency. So we, we set a lot of store by training. Um, at the centre, we want to make sure people know what they're doing and feel well supported in, in what they're doing. So a question really to everyone is, without being shown how to perform a task, how can you expect repeatability? I think that we've all been in laboratories where we've just been, the door has been opened, you've been pointed to a bench and a set of pipettes and you've been told to see you later. And I would argue that's not learning, that is just um, reinventing the wheel it's making mistakes for no reason. And sometimes people never know they're actually making those mistakes if they learn like that. I think that supported um, learning and teaching and training is a really important thing. Dentists, other professionals do it. Why do scientists not do it? Why is it kind of seen as some kind of rite of passage to be thrown into a laboratory and kind of learn on the fly? But that happens a lot for people. So my last tip really is scientists are human and always remember that, that it's in our nature to make to um, cut corners. We all do. We'll always take the path of least resistance. We make mistakes. Um, it's we're human. So just think about when you're um, showing someone what to do. You know, take the time. We all learn at different um, speeds, and, and make sure they're supported in that learning. Um, I think that's a that's a huge um, sort of thing. From I've talked to a lot of people before this. Um, seminar and this has been a big bit of feedback is that people often really don't feel very comfortable in what they're doing and they're just left to their own resources and I think this must be a massive source of problem um, within the community. Um, so yeah that's that's it for me so back to John now. Oh, thanks Helen. Uh, before I talk about unconscious bias I just pick up a couple of the things you said and I, I want to just relate a personal experience where I wasted six months of my PhD because the protocol I was following wasn't sufficiently well documented and my knowledge base wasn't sufficiently high. 
So I was asked to, uh, as the starter, to repeat um, a previous PhD student's uh, work on um, protein synthesis in mitochondria. And uh, using C14 labeled amino acids, this was years ago, and to, to carry on the work. And he'd already left, but um, so I had a sort of brief protocol, but I could never get, I only ever got 10% of the incorporation that he'd recorded. And it took six months before somebody and we were trying to scratch our heads, see what was going wrong. And somebody pointed out that the uh, that the um, ATP solution that I was using as a stock should be should be pH to seven, because it's labile. You know, when you just dissolve it in water, mm. and it's at pH four point five or something. And I thought, oh bloody hell! And there was no mention of that in the protocol that the, uh, the stock solution of the ATP that was going into the reaction should be normalized. They wasted six months of my life. Uh, simply because of that lack, lack of detail. So the second comment I'd make is that just to reinforce lab, lab archives. When we were at Garvin, we made that compulsory because of the, the fantastic structure, but it also has another really great advantage. And that is that when you leave to go on your postdoc or whatever it is you do next, um, you know, you've got a full copy of your lab records with you, but a full copy can remain at the Institute, which is required by NHMRC and ARC, et cetera as part of the uh, requirements for, for research. So, you know, you don't have to worry about physical lab books. You've got an electronic one, which is clonable and, uh, and portable. So in lab archives is fantastic. And I, I think it should be compulsory um, for everybody. And the third thing I'd say is just to, to reinforce again what, what Helen was saying. Imagine uh, not just trying to uh, advise your successor how to do the experiments that you've been doing, but uh, how to, to program a robot to do it. If you had to say, uh, just using verbal commands, you know, to a robot, you know, that you wanted to do this assay, you wanted to take a hundred different, um, let's take five different cell lines with a hundred different conditions in microtiter plates and, and do these assay, there might be luciferase, there might be RNA-seq or whatever. How would you, provide sufficient information that robot to be able to, to give that robot or another individual enough information that they could execute the experiment um, without having to guess some of the steps. And that means it would be reproducible. So I think the messages before I get to unconscious bias uh, very quickly are that re uh, really important to put a lot of time into experimental design. You know, what's going to go into each tube, how you label each tube, what the controls are, etc. Really think about the experiment you're doing, what should the question you're trying to ask or the thing you're trying to do, and to really design it well. And you'll never regret spending the time doing that because if it's designed well, then you can focus on execution uh, and do that well as well. And you get those two things right, you know, you're, you're in good shape. You need highly well-documented protocols from others, or you should do it yourself if you're doing something new. You need you know, proper training, you need well-calibrated equipment, all the things that go in the background. And you need to be aware that any experiment that's got um, uh, unknown variables in it, like fetal calf serum, uh, that relies on batch effects, then is probably not worth doing. You should go and talk to your boss or supervisor about what, why you're even doing that experiment in the first place, because it won't be reproducible anywhere else. By de almost by definition. So the last thing, um, which is more philosophical, but I think really important and maybe slightly provocative, and that is the unconscious bias that occurs with uh, the kind of reductionism that uh, characterizes our discipline. So that um, if, if I'm just trying to think how to best express this, if you are um, you know, really interested in a particular protein or gene or pathway. Let's take P53, that's an important one. Um, or Rubisco, you know, in uh, photosynthesis. Um, you know, it, it's not hard to make a case about how important those uh, proteins and their encoded, encoding genes are. But if, you've, um, if you're focused on a particular gene or pathway and, and, and your grant applications are all written around how important that particular protein is towards a particular process like cancer or diabetes or whatever it might be, then it's in your professional interest to make that the greatest thing since sliced bread. And every experiment you design, every data uh, result that you interpret, every data set that you select or cherry pick, cherry pick is all subconsciously devoted to that outcome because your professional career 
becomes um, linked to whether that protein, how important that protein might be. And you know, if you think unconscious bias in the workplace is a problem, this is a huge problem in research, much greater because you know, it's, it's, it's your career, it's your grants, it's your everything. So my advice is to think very carefully about whether you're studying a, a process, a phenomenon or a component. Because if you're studying the process, say diabetes or cancer, you can be quite flexible about which components or variables in that problem might be interesting, which approaches, whether it's genetics combined with biochemistry or cell biology that you take to try and understand diabetes or cancer or development or whatever it might be. But if you're focusing on a particular subcomponent in those worlds, then you're at serious risk for unconscious bias in the way you design, interpret, select the experiments, select the data, interpret the data. The data. And I think that is a, the major unacknowledged problem in what's published, apart from the all the other factors that we've talked about. So um, that's a philosophical point, but one I think is worth reflecting on. I think Helen and I are very happy to uh, have comments, uh, questions, whatever, so as long as time allows. We've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so, Marty, over to you as the moderator, I suppose. And, um, unless Helen wants to make any final comments. No, I think um, that pretty much sums it up. I see there's some questions in the, well, a question from Rich in the chat. Um, Rich, do you want to talk to that? If you want me to. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's not a, a new observation, but I'd just be interested to hear your um, <laughs> your thoughts on the fact that one of the problems, I, as far as I can see, is that we're always judging people and being judged on our outputs and our, our sort of e externally and sort of superficial <laughs> productivity um, rather than actual getting to grips with whether people are doing things right and well and reproducibility and I mean some of the issues you've been talking about are things which don't necessarily come out until years afterwards and if someone's already got their nature paper and has launched their career it kind of almost doesn't matter whether that nature paper was real or not from a, a career point of view because by then they'll have had other opportunities and they'll have done other good things and um, and so it seems that even with PhD students they're under a pressure to to publish papers within the school we reward we have a top-up scholarship which is related to publishing a paper in the first year and it's, it's nothing to do about the things that you've been talking which i agree in my opinion uh, of what good science is all about is you know designing good experiments having good controls really thinking it through taking your time um and yet all our reward mechanisms seem to not reward that so um <laughs> so would you hey do, do you do you think i'm being being unjust in that view of of how we reward science and and b do you have any suggestions of what we can do about it i suppose well helen do you mind if i start off yeah, yeah go ahead yeah um, i i um i agree rich i agree entirely in fact it's a huge structural problem it's not one that's we have any control over much at the moment because it is the way the system is is is, is formed but um uh i'm part of a group uh, in the uk that's trying to change the system so you've actually touched on something i've got a lot of interest in uh, this short termism on uh, impact factors you know uh quick outputs and also um not allowing people enough stability and a long enough runway to do really good experiments that are careful and ambitious in their intellectual scope as well. So there is, uh, the Wellcome Trust is now doing this to more extent, but they, 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 they're looking into it even more carefully. Um, the, there's a move afoot to say we should be replacing uh, short-term grants with, with fellowships, basically. Now the NHMRC tried this and so did the Canadians and got a lot of pushback because it wasn't, it could have been handled better perhaps, but, but also there are a lot of vested interests in the present structure. But imagine a situation where you have a seven year grant, you know, pick a number and a million dollars a year to, to look at, you know, animal development, whatever. And uh, you don't have to do anything else except come back at five years and report what you've been able to achieve in that. And so you've got a very stable um, financial platform. It's very flexible. You're not tied to any particular set of experiments that you had to describe in your grant application. It's a bit more like the um, Laureate Fellowship sort of stuff. 
and uh, you've got two years to um, uh, run away if, um, if things are still not worked out at five. So the whole idea is to give uh, gifted people, uh, you know, a much more stable financial and uh, platform and timescale to be um, brave and to do things properly. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of pushback, as I said, when the Canadians tried it with their foundation grants and the NHMRCs tried it, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's been tears everywhere because uh, a lot of people are living hand to mouth with short term grants and we're sort of stuck with that as well. So. Yeah, the other thing that's been avoided out of the system has been um, that base technical staff being around and present and always there to, to do these experiments well, that just seems to have kind of vanished almost. When I started my PhD at an MRC in Edinburgh, and I was really very fortunate that I had um, some technical staff there to show me cell culture, show me how to do it well. And they spent the time to do that. And it was such a valuable thing. And that type of position, that sort of career technician that's supported just seems to have kind of vanished now. And they're not around to support younger researchers in, in the lab space, which is a real shame. Yeah. So um, we should be trying to um, talk more which about the structures that actually encourage this sort of, you know, rushed short-termism. Um, the, the impact is how many um, citations you get rather, or, or what impact back to journaling publishing rather than how important what you've found might be or reproducible. Yeah, I had a uh, somewhat similar question to Rich, but maybe uh, from a different angle. So I'm, Thinking about why is it that in biology, as opposed to other sciences such as mathematics, there's very little accountability for publishing irreproducible results. So for a mathematician, if they publish a wrong result, their career is significantly impacted. Some people's careers are over after, a, a, you know, after publishing the wrong result. While you know, biologists publish wrong results successfully uh, you know, I can give multiple examples, you know, to me, one of the, you know, famous examples is an RNA editing paper that was entirely an artifact of sequencing errors. And that the author is a Howard Hughes investigator. Um, so it had virtually no effect on, on the career. Uh, so why are we biologists so tolerant to, um, to lack of reproducibility? Why aren't we, you know, once, once the fact that something is not reproducible is brought to light, the paper is not even retracted. Um, you know, we've written somewhat recently in a paper that, um, you know, high impact result was reproducible. And that was picked up by a different lab that wrote an entire paper proving that it was reproducible and the initial paper wasn't retracted. So um, yeah, what, what, why do you think that is? Why are we so tolerant to, to that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I have a actually um, point on that. I think um, not as specifically about that paper. I haven't seen that paper, but I think biology is very, very complex. So it's not yeah, really easy well, to prove what is I mean, um, right. I mean, but on the other hand, I think we, we compared tend, to mathematics, I agree, is... but uh, we tend to rest on this complexity and it's sort of a comfort, you know, we all have this excuse. Oh, well, in my particular setting, in my, you know, conditions of temperature and lab airflow and everything, that's what the result was. I but think is, Irina, that, is that too... good enough? Yeah, and you know, if you follow Retraction Watch, I don't know if any of you hang out on that website to see no. what goes on, but some people who have been kind of, you know, seriously kind of indicted on that are still have careers. So it seems that it is a thing in biology that it's kind of okay. We'll not talk about that and off you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that, that I think is a problem that we might want to think about. And also the way we are trained, I think I've seen uh, in the comments from Marcel talking about um, the optimistic approach to things, you know, so I think criticism is seen negatively being self-critical or critical of your colleagues and trainees 
is sometimes not you know an easy thing to 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 accept or to digest and i think that's actually quite important we should and you know my students know that i strongly encourage them to be the strongest critics of their own data uh, they should be the first to question every single result that they get the moment you get a result the next question should be why could this be confounded you know and after you pass your own questions and your colleagues' questions, then it may be uh, good to go for publication. But sometimes, because of the pressure to publish, um, you know, that's not, I'm, I'm not sure that it's necessarily part of the standard way we're um, trying to approach things. And secondly, when we train people, how often do we teach people how to identify confounded results. You know, I feel like part of a big major part of my job is to, to spot possibly confounded results, right? Um, and yet I don't think I've been taught how to do it. Every, and it's an, you know, as much as we can, we should in fact train people on poor data, you know, show them how confounded results look like. I'm trying to do it, you know, in the human genetics, I always give an example I had as a postdoc, especially with new technology, right? Um, yeah, we, we had a, a result with uh, DNA methylation arrays that just came out that showed perfect separation of autism and control samples. And it, it was only because these were new arrays that had a gradient of, of intensity and uh, autism samples were the, at the top of the chip and the control samples were at the bottom of the chip, right? But you have to have, right? <laughs> and I tell this to my students every year because, you know, the bioinformatician came to me and said, oh, results are great. You know, we have a huge, you know, great result. It's like, oh crap, we have a massive artifact. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> it's something because autism is not a disease of DNA methylation. <laughs> so we'd know it by now if it was so massive. Anyways, but I think the more examples we give like that uh, to students, the more equipped they are to, to spot them in their own research. Yeah, that's great advice, Irena. Um, I just saw also a, a comment from, uh, and I agree with you about M M Marcel's comment about uh, looking to what, uh, for what happens if you don't get the result you expect so that you're not sort of conditioning yourself to be uh, looking for the one that you expect. But is that... And so Marcel, uh, sorry, um, Merlin also asked about what's yeah. the best solution to problems like batch variation in fetal calf serum. And I'm not sure, Merlin, if you're still there. Um, oh, yes, you are. Um, but I think it's the, way, the only way I can think off the top of my head is to actually repeat the experiment in several batches and see if you get the same result, um, which would reassure you and you could say in the publication that the, there was uh, it was um, the result was stable to batch effects from the from these components which are you know whereas if you got a different result then you, you'd know that you, you you didn't have something that was robust yeah can you hear me i'm not sure yes, yes we can hear yeah. we'll so see i you. think it's right it depends on whether bad batches occur one out of a thousand fetal calf shipments or one out of two fetal calf shipments. And I've never been sure of it, but I do think occasionally they do occur. So the idea of getting a good shipment and a large amount in, I think that they're, they're rare though, but I, I've never been absolutely sure. That's whether... why you lot track, Marilyn. That's why you need to record the lots in every experience. Yeah, well, you have to publish it with various things. They make you publish the lot. So it is clear that there are some reagents where there is inherent variability. So in those cases, I think it's good practice to try to reduce the variability as much as possible and record it, as you say. I mean, I think I, I agree with everything that's been said, except I think there are some problems that you have just got to get the best possible solution. And I think sticking to one batch is actually the better solution. You know. no, no, I have to disagree, Merlin, because if um, if you only get that result with the one batch, then by and a different batch will give you a different result. Let's just take the worst case scenario. Uh, then that result is by definition not reproducible. 
So I, I think actually, uh, you know, repeating the experiment with three different batches, you get the same result with each of the three of them. You can say, okay, uh, I'm pretty sure this is not being affected by uh, some unknown ingredient in the batch I used. So that's, that'd be, yeah, by the way, and, and another thing that just occurs to me is that, and the journals are now starting to insist on this, is uh, a declaration of blinded, res, uh, double blinded experiments. One of our problems is the way we do experiments is that student or postdoc who designs the experiment knows which mice is which or which cell line is which or which, you know, and then is interpreting the data. And in fact, it should be done completely blind so that the actual analysis or the, the data collection is done by somebody who doesn't know what sample A, B, and C are, which uh, neutralizes that some of that unconscious bias. So what happens to the lab, just the lab, the very small ones that had just one postdoc or students, <laughs> this type of stuff? It's, it's, a, it's a problem, but at least the, um, the student or postdoc should be counseled to say, look, you know, you've got to be rigorously, um, uh, or get somebody else to label the tubes. That's all. Just say, look, here's tubes. Uh, I'll give you three batch of tubes, you know, and, and uh, I'll call the first batch A, B, and C, but you label them, you know, X, Y, Z in any random way, uh, but just record whether A is X or whatever it is, and they'll come back later and deconvolute it. That's one way around it. Yeah. But, you know, it's just a, it's just a problem. Um, all these things conspire. You've got two actual issues here. One is how well designed your experiment is and, um, and how clean your result is in your own hands. And then you've got a second issue is how reproducible is it in others' hands where some of those other variables come into play. So. Um, if I could just make a comment on batch effects. Was, this, this is something that I, I really saw, a, we, we saw a lot of in doing things like RNA-seq microarrays in particular you know, even using a different, it, it, it really surprised me that even using a different um, library prep kit, for example, in RNA, in RNA sec, you'll be familiar with this, Helen, ha can have this dramatic effect on different them. on, on yep. the differential expression. So much so that you'll get an entirely different set yep. of different differentially expressed transcripts if you change your kit that was used for the library prep, for instance. Now, that to me is hugely alarming, right? I mean, that makes you think, well, what the hell are we doing? You know, <laughs> if the library, pep, you know, if that if that kit has more effect than the two different cell types or whatever it is, whatever your conditions are that you're measuring, I'd be incredibly concerned about my experiment. I mean, I you know to the point that you're thinking, and it's the same actually. And some of the ones that really surprised me were even just different models of sequencer. You know, where everything else was the same, and you would switch from something like even a NovaSeq to a, a high seq, which should be a subtly different chemistry, that the results from an RNA seq experiment from that are not comparable. And it, it, it is really just pause for thought of, yep. what, of what that actually says about the experiment you're doing, that the instrument that you're measuring with should have such a dramatic impact on, on your data. From what I'm hearing, that's exactly what's happening with single cell data generated with different chemistries of 10x. So we're working with Ryan Lister's lab and Ryan is so, you know, thorough and goes. So because they've done this project for, on, for such a long time, they had to move from one chemistry to the other as the 10x chemistry changed. And they see very strong effects of the 10x chemistry and the 10x kits as they change. So they keep redoing <laughs> the results over and over again. So this project has been going on for years and years just because they've been, they kept comparing and you know, that, that has a strong effect. But on the other hand, you know, if you don't have the luxury to keep working on a project for, not, for a long time and there is this pressure, you know, you've generated one single cell data set, analyzed it, published it, that's that that's really i think where there is quite a a risk to publish irreproducible results because you know then the next chemistry comes and who knows if it reproduces or not um yeah. richard go ahead yeah. i'll just make a comment on, on this it's, it's something we come across actually a lot in in bioinformatics that there's actually two kinds of reproducibility that i think that we're, we're talking about and so one which comes out to this this sort of fetal serum thing there's a reproducibility that if you do exactly the same thing again you're going to get exactly the same results 
and that's kind of it is important as much as possible but it's kind of the boring part of reproducibility <laughs> reproducibility really is that the answer the interpretation means what you think it means right and obviously, if you, what you're doing ends up with a random re result, then it's unlikely to. But you can actually be very consistently repeating the same thing, get the same thing every time, but still miss something like <laughs> Marcel just said about the, the sequencing machine, which actually <laughs> you would never even considered would be a factor. In a, a, and, and so you need to do other experiments and other things really to confirm results. And that's, yeah. I think, why. So I, I don't see that the, all the, the lack of reproducibility as a, a crisis a problem because I think that's how part of how science advances is that you you think you do an, an experiment and you think it means something and then you come along and you have to test it in a left right and center and hammer out which yeah. are the robust things which which carry through and which don't if, and if you can validate and so one question it. there I guess is how how much I, I how much you think it's important actually to go back and just be do, being able to get the same result over and over again versus spending the time having a completely orthogonal uh, experiments which if it what you think the result is true is going to be you confirm it completely independently rather than confirming it it should be the, the latter over and over and over yeah um, it should be the latter that it's done where you're independently verifying it with a different technique so when sequencing uh, ngs first came out everyone was publishing these papers and there was no validation because it was seen as this pure thing you're sequencing everything it's the way forward and publication after publication and those of us who'd been doing arrays knew you couldn't do that because you still have to validate it with a different technique so i think validating it in another way is far more important than necessarily just repeating the same thing over and over again Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, as as long as another method is available, actually. Well, there's that problem, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> if you're at the yeah. cutting edge, you may be out there. <laughs> well, we haven't even talked about the wrong conceptual framework. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my, my other comment is just to remind people that you, there are controls in data analysis as well. And so the other thing you can do is go back. <laughs> it, you can make predictions back about other things that are going on in your data, uh, which is where you would pick up things like the the top of the array and the bottom of the array being being different. So, um, yeah, it's ideal to go outside, but sometimes you can find out that things are going screwy just by having the right positive and negative controls within your data analysis, which seems to be something else that people often forget. Um, yeah. They just say bioinformatics is rubbish. <laughs> Okay, so that's five past four. I think there is, do you want to continue or somebody else has got comments or? Well, I'm happy to bet on, but. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still so curious as to how, how we reward the good behavior. So, so, I mean, I know you've you talked about some things that are going on of long-term grants and things to try and bypass some of the upstream problem, but that's still not really necessarily rewarding people well, doing the right thing. It's just giving them more opportunity to get the, the rewarded result by doing the right thing. Which, uh, uh, yeah, so. it's a good question, but I go back to the first reward is actually the increased productivity and confidence in what you're seeing. I mean, I couldn't believe the difference between before and after when I slowed down and just designed the experiment properly. And I, I actually designed the whole thing to tube you know, which microliters and stuck that in front of my face and just followed my own instructions so I could focus totally on execution because I'd done all the planning separately. But the, the difference was extraordinary. It, the, the benefit was immediate for me because I was very productive, but also I was very confident the data that I was getting, this was back in the days of doing Western blots and things, but nevertheless, it was really, really clean. And, um, I just made so much progress. So that was a really... Uh, positive feedback. So at one level, just really good experimental planning and execution has its own reward in terms of increased productivity and confidence. You know, whether um, your results stand the test of time because you've got very unknown variables like which which model of sequence you use. I mean, that's a new one for me, Marcel. That's, <laughs> that really worries me too. But, but you know, there's you can't you can't be perfect, maybe. But at least if we and I think Marcel's suggesting maybe we record this or 
And I talked, by the way, Marcel, to Helen about maybe if this was uh, successful, we might just write a short article about these different factors, maybe giving some examples and things that might be useful to people. But I think good experimental planning, design and execution, but also awareness of the variables that might cause you trouble, um, you know, including um, unknown bits of protocols like having to buffer the ATP solution, well, bloody hell. Um, you know, all of these things can help you be more productive and, and make, make your research more worthwhile. And just a final thought, if okay with you guys, um, it just came to me while hearing all of these discussions of transcriptomics and such. And there are so many consortia that generate data, you know, in bulk tissues, in single cell tissues, they're all, um, you know, looking at various things. But I don't think there is a transcriptomics reproducibility consortium that actually puts all of these data together and figures out which results are consistent across modalities, right? Um, how about we do that? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, you know, it doesn't even cost as much money to, as it does to generate the data, to put them together and see what's, what holds. Um, anyways, yeah, um, I, I think it's, for our own purposes, we usually start by comparing several data sets, so might as well. It would be Make nice to sort of uh, a system of trust score or something like that that could be attributed to data sets because mm. you know there are indeed thousands, tens of thousands of data sets out there. It would be nice to have almost a way of distinguishing between those that are questionable um, veracity versus those that have been done meticulously. And you know, look, I, I don't know what to say. To be honest, to be honest, so we were. We we're trying to figure out, by the way, for Kirith Ray's uh, PhD. So we we're trying to figure out how a certain gene is expressed. And we looked at GTEx and we looked at brain span. And what we are getting for, from these two consortia with very high trust scores is quite different in terms of the top brain expressed isoform. So, yeah, I think the trust scores are a really cool idea. I'm not sure. Well, I guess oh, what I'm saying is it would be a, a community driven. Yeah. Trust, com yeah, right? where, yeah. Where potentially hundreds of people have looked at a data. Yeah. Set and oh, yeah. Have come to I the see. So of, rather hey, than having, yeah, yeah, yeah. A good one. This one yeah. seems to yeah. make sense to us and it validates, oh. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, versus ones that, that, that don't. That don't. Yep, yep. That makes uh, sense. Quick comment. Uh, so so uh, I think Merlin's left, but he, he did ask a very good question, which was what's next? Um, I, I think these sessions are really, are really terrific. And, and, and the engagement has certainly gone up, which was the idea. Um, did did want, to point, want to put out any ideas or, um, or feedback in terms of, of, of what else we might explore in these, these, um, uh, in these, in these broader sessions within, in, in the school? So that's more something to put out there. But if you do have ideas, perhaps you know, email them to Marty or John and, and we can look at those because I think this is, this is really, really useful. Uh, so I've, I've got some ideas, but I didn't want to push them forward because uh, um, I'd love to hear from people. We didn't get, Helen responded about, because I'd mentioned about average disability and Merlin, you know, that's why the first two have kicked off this way, but it just colleagues would be great if you've got something that you'd like to talk and you think it'd be interesting. That, that will, whether it's conceptual, philosophical, you know, practical, um, you know, uh, but in the, in the absence of, other suggestions, I might come up with a couple, but I'd rather rather leave it to others first, you know, if possible. You know, thanks, John. Mm. Yeah, someone's on. Um, Marty, did you have any uh, closing comments before we we wrap up? Oh, Merlin uh, made a comment there again on do students have issues that we should discuss? Uh, well, yeah, almost certainly. Um, <laughs> We actually had a we had a terrific session, Merlin, um, uh, earlier in the week that that Kate and Jai and and, and Michael ran on um, for HDR students to provide a Q and A opportunity for them to talk through um, through a very very a variety of matters, including um, but I guess they were more practical and operational type matters on candidature. Um, but yes, I, I I do agree, and I do wonder whether honors and PhD students in particular. Um, would would value a forum to 
um, where we can, I, 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 I guess, I guess, help and support them in their in their world of research, um, both career-wise, but also in in, in the lab and um, planning papers, um, all of these sorts of things, which I know are top of mind for for a lot of um, uh, students and junior academics as well, for that matter. Yeah, I just think this is a great, this two-person format is really cool. And um, yeah, I know John worked hard to, to do something different. This is different, it's great. If people could email, I don't know, in suggestions, uh, it'd be really, it's terrific. Because it's great to see the attendance is, is quite good these days. Thanks. Great. Um, I think, um, uh, okay, uh, I will send the recording to uh, Brenda. So that would be available. I mean, if you want it, Brenda, um, maybe yeah. we can post it on SharePoint. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, that was a great session. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. I mean, my thinking there was that, you know, I, I think that for honor students, some of this would be huge. Yeah. yeah. It's the first time going into a lab when you're of, you know, when your experience in research has been really running, pro, you know, uh, uh, living the life of protocols as we do in, in the undergrad labs, which are very, very protocol driven, and then stepping into the research world, that is the transition, right? You've gone into, you've gone from protocol land to, you know, some sort of uh, um, sink or swim world of, of what, what, what most research laboratories are, where protocols are few and, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of left to go for it. Uh, and that's when all the mistakes are made too. So I think having an awareness of that at least would be, you know, hugely valuable. And as, and as John has pointed out, just the pitfalls of, of, of going ahead and having a go can be an, just an enormous waste of time as opposed to really thinking things through and, and, and developing your protocol, checking it in with your supervisor and, and working out, well, what is, is this, is this, is this a reasonable way forward? Is this going to give me a result that's going to be meaningful that when I present it at my next lab meeting, I'm not going to look like a, <laughs> I look like I've made a terrible mistake. Yeah. Well, why six months? Because nobody told me. You're quite bitter about years. that, John. <laughs> you know, what, what a, I mean, what a waste, you know. <laughs> Apparently, I thought I should know that. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, okay. I, I think that's probably one of the most common lines that comes from supervisors to students that students hit with, receive with the most disdain and surprise is the, you should have known that. <laughs> you should have told me that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be the response. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, Helen. That was a great session. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, Thanks everyone. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.